So again, the format is similar to this morning. So if you have a question, uh, we would welcome that. But um, Professor Clark, maybe you want to start with something for our panel? Can I start with a... Can I start with a general question? I would love to ask some scientific questions, wade into this whole design versus evolve debate. Uh, what can artificial intelligence tell us, if anything, about protein design? What have you learned about protein folding in vivo based on your experiments in vitro and so forth and so on? Is that but, all you want to know? I'm sorry. Is that all? <laughs> <laughs> These are just some things that occurred to me. Uh, but I wonder if each of you could just say a little bit about what inspired you to pursue a career in science. We have many high school yeah. students out here who are probably considering such a career, such a path. So I'm wondering if you sharing briefly your own experiences might provide them with some guidance as to whether they should follow their own passions and instincts. You want to start? Fair question. Francis? Well, back in the 70s, I was kind of a rebel and obnoxious, and my father said no one would ever marry me, so I should get a job in engineering. <laughs> <laughs> he said, he, actually, he said, he said, you should do something where you'll always have a job, right? And um, that was mechanical engineering, so I went into mechanical engineering. And you know what? I've always had a job. You have. I think you always will. <laughs> yeah, probably will, Francis. Well, I, uh, 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 I'm the first scientist in my family. Um, when I was 11 years old, um, I was starting to mix chemicals together. I'm not sure why, uh, but I mixed a couple of iron cyanides together that were more or less colorless and I got a deep uh, blue dye that's called Prussian blue. I didn't know it was called Prussian blue at the time, but, it, but the, the excitement of, of mixing two solutions that essentially had no color, actually one was light yellow, the other one was colorless, and I went into the other, and it became this dark blue uh, that was made in 1706 by, uh, 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 by Johann Diesbach in Berlin and was, curl, was called Berliner Blau. Then, and then the Prussian army decided to, they would uh, dye all their uh, uniforms with this Berliner Blau and then it became known as Prussian Blue. But I didn't know any of that at the time. I learned that later, but uh, I said, what in the world is this color due to? How can you mix two things that don't have color and you get this dark blue stuff? So that, that helped me right then. And then I started ordering uh, chemicals from a, from a supply house in Chicago that didn't know that I was 12 and 13 years old. And uh, I was ordering big bottles of nitric acid and sulfuric acid and they, they thought I was a professor from Vanderbilt. Uh, but, but I was 12 years old and I had these big bottles of acid and I was doing all kinds of great stuff, making compounds and, and making colors and uh, that really hooked me. And it was many, many, many years later I figured out what, what, why Prussian blue was dark blue. <laughs> but in the meantime, I learned that uh, Vincent van Gogh or Vincent van Gogh as we call him incorrectly in this country, Vincent van Gogh used this uh, beautiful blue paint to paint all of his wonderful paintings, including his masterpiece, uh, and, uh, which is called Starry Night, which some of you may have seen. Uh, because the painters, the painters initially completely went over to this blue dye because it was all inorganic. There wasn't any organic stuff in it. And so it didn't degrade under ultraviolet light. All the organic dyes degrade very quickly. You put them out in the light and they, you know, you can see all these things fade. But Prussian blue never, never fades. So all the, 
all the artists really got into this in the 18th century and uh, still it's used uh, today an enormous amount of Prussian blue is used as a uh, therapeutic uh, it's uh, it's got all of these uh, oh by the way uh, it's a uh, you work on moths this is a MIF it's a <laughs> inorganic <laughs> It's got lots of holes in it, Omar, you know that. And you can get cesium in it uh, and the radioactive cesium. It picks up. It picks up thallium plus one poison. It picks it up. So it's, it's used all the time now as in the medical world. Uh, it's, it's full of cyanide. It's full of cyanide, but the cyanide doesn't come out. You can, you can eat 50 grams of Prussian blue a day. <laughs> and uh, and not get sick. Uh, your urine may look a little different. <laughs> if you want dark blue urine, <laughs> you don't learn this stuff just anywhere. Yeah, bro. yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's how I got hooked. Well, I want to hear from you, but I must comment that uh, one of the things that inspired me to pursue a career in chemistry was taking freshman chemistry and using his textbook because the examples in that textbook are just as colorful, no pun intended, as his description of how he was playing with cyanides and sulfuric acid as a 12-year-old, where your parents were during this time, I don't know, but. Well, my mother was scared to death that I was gonna blow up the house. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I followed safety rules from the very beginning. I, I was extremely careful. <laughs> uh, Obviously, it all worked out. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay, then. what can I add to this? <laughs> well, well, actually, my story, how I got interested in, 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 or, you know, wanted to stay in academia or do a scientific career, I think it came to me during my undergraduate years. I didn't know what research was before that. I mean, so it was really in the end of my four-year undergraduate program that I spent a year in, in, in London, going from Sweden to London, because I like to travel, so I wanted to do an exchange year. And there they put me in a lab to do research, and I had to discover new things, and I, I just loved it. So then I realized, you can go back, you can get a PhD, and you know, then things, one thing added to another. So I think it's that kind of this excitement mm -hmm. about finding, you know, discovering things you know, making an experiment and whatever you find out, nobody else might have done that before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's always very exciting, discovering new knowledge. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for that. Uh, should we, we turn yeah. the questioning to the audience now? Yes, uh, yeah. Bent, I think you had a question or two, did you not? We Would want like high school say? students to ask questions. Yeah. Well, let's, why don't you uh, start with a question and then maybe we could get some of the high school students to speak. Prime the phone. Professor Yagi, why okay. don't you go next? Uh, all right. I, have a th th I just want to thank the, all of you for wonderful, uh, stimulating talks. Um, my question is for Francis, and uh, it pertains to your lovely uh, illustration and characterization of how your heme was able to carry out um, this transformation. Does that, does that mean that you're limited by the size of this pocket that is, um, is generated uh, in, the, uh, in the catalyst? And uh, I guess my question is more, more broadly, where is, this, where is all this going? Does it, does it go beyond small molecules? Does it go into molecules that we really, really want and need? Um, before we abandon the chemistry uh, view approach. Yeah. Well, that's a lot of questions. Um, let's see if I can. So I think you're getting at it, 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 enzymes have evolved all sorts of different active site sizes, as you well know. Uh, and some enzymes can accommodate lots of different sized substrates. I mean, they're really very adaptable when it comes to being able to accommodate different sized substrates. Some have pockets on their surfaces, which mean they can grab big molecules and, and modify them at a very specific site, even though it's really big. Others, you know, have to 
grab the whole molecule. So there are many different solutions that evolution has come up to. When it comes to me making an enzyme, I have to choose what parent I'm going to start with. So in many cases, you can think of that as the design aspect, right? Where would you get started if you wanted to make an enzyme that modifies a polymer or a surface or a small molecule? Yeah. And where's it going? Who knows? <laughs> what will we discover? What will evolution discover? Uh, but one thing we're putting final touches on, I think, will be a really important paper on degradation of environmental pollutants that people thought were non-biodegradable, right? So there are all sorts of things that we could do if you open up your mind uh, about what the chemistry of enzymes really encompasses. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Professor Norden. <clears throat> it's a, a question to Harry. Uh, you have invented many ways of chasing electrons and changing conformation in proteins and so on. Um, one might ask what time resolution is the shortest time you really need? Is it uh, microseconds or is it uh, faster than that? Is it femtoseconds? Well, I, uh, uh, of course, if you go back to femtoseconds and picoseconds, you can see uh, rotations and, and things in the protein that are really very fast, but they're not very important. Uh, the important things start uh, in about 100 nanoseconds where you make the first native contact. The other, the other stuff is just a little wiggling and jiggling, uh, which doesn't really amount to much. And so um, you really need techniques that, uh, in order to study the the really important processes that involve uh, b barriers, significant barriers. Uh, you really need the techniques to start in the, uh, in the nanosecond range. That's the answer. And uh, out to very long times because uh, uh, it takes a long time to get the water out finally of folded proteins. So the answer is uh, a few nanoseconds. I think in the picosecond and femtosecond range for protein folding are just are interesting things intellectually and uh, interesting things to look at from theory and so forth, but the real action starts when the first native contact is made. All right, I'm going to ask, why does it take so long to get the last waters out? Well, um, they're pretty well trapped in these cavities when it folds. And they're surrounded in hydrogen bonded uh, to residues, and they're pretty happy uh, because there's a lot of water. There's a lot of water around, and when you make the uh, what's called the molten globule, there's a lot of water in that. It's expanded out from the folded structure, and as you fold uh, from the molten globule type of things into the close to the folded structure, where most of spectroscopic methods will say it's fully folded. There's still water, a few water molecules trapped that are very happy in hydrogen bonded positions. And they take a long time to, with all well, kinds of dynamics to move out, Francis. Uh, but Harry, can I, can I ask to that? I also thought about that. Is it all protein molecules that have some water left? Or is this a fra because you had a distribution. Is it a fraction of the proteins that get stuck in water and the other ones fold? Faster. I think it's mainly the metalloproteins. No, but in, in your case, I mean... In you, a specific protein, yeah. is there a population? Well, cytochrome C uh, is a good example of one that takes a long time. The, mm -hmm. the beta structures, uh, the beta structured proteins like azurin and the blue copper proteins, they squeeze the water out much faster. You know, in the 70s and, and 80s, and a little bit beyond, but a question that was of great interest to at least some people is whether proteins can function in the complete absence of water. And I don't know if that's a topic that maybe for another time, but uh, why is water so important? 
Well, it's extremely important for this particular symposium. <laughs> we have to stick to water. Well, That's a great with, answer. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it at we're, that. We're, we're not talking about acetonitrile in this symposium. <laughs> we're talking about water. <laughs> uh, well thought. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, um, I'm Laka from uh, Professor Yagi Group. So thank you very much for uh, um, wonderful presentation from the speakers. I have a question. Uh, technically, uh, the question encompasses uh, several small questions for Professor uh, Frances Arno, because I feel like in your uh, catalyst, there are something um, we need to understand or at least elaborate more on that. For example, as Professor Yagi mentioned, whether the size of the pocket is important, and also um, you mentioned that the reaction taken um, taken place in water. So whether it can be done in different kind of solvent, water is necessary, a must, um, a must do condition, or we can change it, or you can change the size of the catalyst, and whether you can change the ligands binding to your metal active size before um, before saying that is we really need the protein. For example, if we understand that, we may have to combine two things, pocket size and water, then it's completely different from saying that just pocket size and something else. So if that's the case, chemists even can design a specific molecules or complexes can do the job. Why do we need protein? in this situation. Can you please elaborate more on this? So I started my career when a field called biomimetic chemistry was really hot. And the idea was that if you understood enzymes, you could design small molecule mimics that would be able to do the same chemistry as enzymes. You know what they found out? It didn't work. <laughs> Something you needed not just the first shell, you needed no. the second shell, then you need the third shell, and you need all the cooperative interactions. And it, so we realized that we just didn't understand well enough how most enzymes, some enzymes, so you could probably make small molecule mimics or even big molecule mimics, but most enzymes, we learned that we really couldn't do that. So my response would be, well, now that we understand that, and we have all these tools to use evolution, why not create, cre uh, treat enzymes as evolvable ligands, right? It, it's a very nice system. Water compatible, I mean, maybe if you want to use them in the gas phase, they're probably not the best, but uh, why not just use enzymes? <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Uh, we agree that uh, it's a very green system. But you know, apart from that, we just want to know whether, for example, have you do a like control reaction with very similar um, entity? Yeah. No. So all the cofactors. So for example, the iron heme cofactor can do the simplest of the carbene transfer reactions. Actually, nobody knew that that it worked in water before we tried these things. But it turns out you can do a lot of carbene transfer, but you can't make cyclobute, bicyclobutanes from alkynes. Standing right next to you is the person who did that for the first time. And um, <laughs> so you could go beyond what was known with small molecule complexes. And why is that possible? It's because the protein scaffold imparts a lot of properties. The ability to choose one reaction pathway over multiple side reactions the ability to um, activate substrates, the ability to get rid of water when you need to. So this, and it's highly evolvable, highly tunable. So what we're learning is we can take small molecule catalysts well beyond where humans could do it by using these protein ligands. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Professor Zare. Thank you. I enjoyed greatly the, the presentations that, I, that I've heard, but I have a question for each of our speakers, which is, do you think we're teaching chemistry at the high school and the beginning college level the right way? 
And this is a serious question I'm asking because listening to your talk, I'm trying to relate it to the way we were training students. And I'm thinking there might be a lot of disconnects. I wonder what you think. Let me start this time. Uh, yeah, I have to think about this. Yeah, you for a think while, about so it while I speak. Help. Well, I think, I think there's a lot we can do to improve teaching at the high school level. And, and just include modern examples and talk more, and just actually bring in scientists more to speak about what goes on. And the textbooks need to be revised. I mean, I have a daughter that's in high school, and I see. Well, they don't even have textbooks anymore sometimes. It's all electronic. But there's a lot of things that we can update and maybe change the order of things or how we combine things. Um, you know, where does biochemistry come in? And what do the high school students here think? How about the high school teachers also? Yeah. Are they still here? We have teachers here too? Yes. Yeah. We want to hear what you think. Yeah. I guess my question is, what do you think it is in high school now, if you think it should be changed? We, we don't lecture. Um, we don't sit here for this amount of time listening. We try to do, both Dr. Hutches and I actually have PhDs in biochemistry and chemistry. And we are bringing that to the classroom. That by all means is not every classroom, but um, we strive to bring this there. Um, Dr. Hutches brought her two students, or they had to leave, who are actually doing research. We started for the first year a scientific research class, above and beyond chemistry, biology, and physics. We're trying. We're trying to send them to you in college. But, to but think. would you say that your curriculum is um, a normal one for high schools in the United States, or is it more? I, I can't speak to that. I had 20 years at an independent school in San Diego and five years up here now. I strive to bring teachers into my department who want to teach like that, mm -hmm. and I think we should do more of it. I yeah, well, it's a little selection bias for this audience, but thank you for doing that. I never yeah. took chemistry in high school, so I can't even speak to it. I didn't get chemistry until I came in graduate school. I had to take all the organic chemistry. In fact, if anybody has my black lightning notes from all those years of organic chemistry in the 1980s, I'd really like to see those, because I was the note taker for black lightning. Oh. <laughs> it might be fun to share the reactions of my eldest daughter, Bethany, uh, went to high school. And she uh, took both chemistry and physics at high school. She was in the AP5 in physics. She did miserably in chemistry. I, I asked her, what's happening? And she said, don't you understand, Daddy? All you need to do is understand a couple of concepts, and you can solve all the physics problems they ask you in high school. She said, chemistry's hopeless. <laughs> she not only found no unifying principles and in biology the way it was being, is is being taught, and of course biology wasn't even being taught. No, this is important, what I'm trying to tell you. And she, let's see if I can try to explain, the, the, the sense of that she could not see the relevance of chemistry to her life, which was missing very, very strongly. And so, she, well, of course, uh, she's ended up quite, quite differently, neither in physics nor in chemistry. Doesn't, doesn't matter, that's fine. But I have a feeling we are actually, as a, as a group of us, ought to be rethinking what we're doing. But I'd like to hear from other people on this. I asked the question, doesn't mean I know the answer. We, we have somebody here who can respond. Well, the uh, problem, Dick, is the... Let's, let's oh, let... Oh, sorry. Okay. Let's hear from an ex expert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. You, your mic is not on. Or, no. All right. no, we can't yeah. hear you. You'll have to get to the mic. Uh, so, the, I actually came from professional industry 
uh, worked as a forensic chemist for 12 years before entering education about four years ago. So I had to have the crash course in science education recently. So this was new news to me. It's probably going to be new news for a lot of you guys who didn't have to enter the high school education world. Uh, I want to say within the last decade, there's been a massive overhaul in how science education is being approached especially in things like chemistry. There's something called the California um, NGSS standards. It's actually overall uh, NGSS, the Next Generation Science Standards. California adopted them, and it's moving away from, uh, hey, we just tell you the thing, and then you tell us back the thing, and then you forget it. Instead, it's moving toward you need to know cross-cutting principles. You need to know how we science, why we science, how it's applicable. And it's moving toward knowing storylines and understanding things like when I teach, for example, acids and bases, it goes with a storyline of, uh, very interestingly, ocean acidification, as mentioned by Professor Sakely, which is what one of my research students is doing, is looking at how to deal with ocean acidification. Or when we talk about things like intermolecular forces, we do it through talking about oil spill cleanups. So it's not the way it was because of that issue that we were seeing. So yes, uh, that's something that has been a rollout, but it's still up to each district to adopt it. And you're right, the order does matter. So for example, we have the luxury as an independent school to say, well, I don't like this order. So I can say, okay, I'm going to choose to build it up from the subatomic particles to atoms to molecules to intermolecular forces to reactions. But other school districts may not. And so that's their individual choice. That's where we're at right now. Okay. Well, Hope thank you. Uh, Harry, did you still have a comment after that? Uh, yes, I, I could talk for a long time on this subject, uh, but I'll limit myself to about three hours. <laughs> uh, you know, in chemistry, uh, I think you have to start with experiments um, so that you have a need to know. Um, you have to have some motivation uh, to study chemistry because our, our courses are technically superb, but they're very boring. Um, taken in isolation without any uh, experimental experience, the chemistry curriculum hasn't changed very much in a hundred years. Um, maybe it's changed a little uh, with the introduction of modern inorganic chemistry. Um, uh, but uh, courses do not courses do not recruit students into chemistry. Research research recruits students. Experimental work recruits students, where students get a chance to do hands-on work and see what they don't know, and and why they need to take courses. Uh, to learn the technical parts that they need, but but without actually doing experiments themselves and figuring out that they really need to know something to actually analyze experiments, there's no motivation. Uh, so the answer to your question, Dick, is that chemistry needs to be changed dramatically, in, at least in this country in order to uh, motivate students to go into the field because um, at this point in history, there's an enormous need for chemists, people well-trained in chemistry because there are three problems, three enormous problems facing mankind in this century, energy, environment, and human health. These are the three big problems. And if you start thinking about it, chemistry is really behind and very important for all of the three really most important problems we're facing in this century. 
It's going to be chemists who figure out energy. It's going to be chemists who figure out how to deal with the environment. And it's chemists and biologists are going to figure out how we're going to do better with human health. And so my answer to you, Dick, is absolutely we need enormous change now in our field. All right, Lori is trying to say your three hours are up. Yeah, well, I, I, I was also thinking you, from the perspective of Francis's father, he might say that if you're a chemist in the next decades, you'll keep a job, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. But um, I think that this uh, uh, teacher from the high school is indicating that, in fact, at least at her high school, it's changed quite a bit, mm. the curriculum. Yeah. Um, but we do have a couple questions here that I think we should take. Well, we have time. I don't know who was first, so go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kai Chen. And uh, I, want to, I, I first want to thank the three speakers, and especially I think it's my privilege to see my two mentors, Francis Arno as my PhD advisor, and Harry Gray as my PhD committee chair, giving the presentations, wonderful you're, you're presentations. Still yeah. well, <laughs> you still pass. <laughs> 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 and I, I love hearing your, st your stories. <laughs> and uh, I have a qu couple of questions. Uh, before that, I just want to clarify, Francis, uh, kind of a couple of questions for you, but I'm still very, very proud to be your student, but I have questions since my, my time in your lab. <laughs> so the first question is, uh, just a little bit of background on like, uh, what do you have already talked about? Like uh, the enzymes evolved in, uh, in, in the Arno lab uh, ha have been doing a lot of great chemistry beyond what have been invented by human beings with small molecule cat uh, catalysts. But sometimes we also saw kind of a limit uh, in the evolved enzyme or what the, uh, kind of what the enzyme can do. But do you think there's a real limit in the evolution, or it's just a kind of fake limit we have been seeing uh, just because the, uh, the sequence space we can access or the sequence space we can explore in reality is kind of limited? That's my first question. Okay, Kai, Kai is a very, very smart student, so rather than me answer the question, I'd really like to hear what you think. <laughs> okay, the question is thrown back yeah. to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, based on my experience, I always think, I always use like some native enzyme as my favorite examples. So I know like uh, in native enzyme, uh, the, the biggest uh, kind of um, acceleration in reaction rate, especially in the kind of, in some spontaneous reaction, can be like 15 orders of, oh, no, not 15 orders, 15 yeah, 15 orders of magnitude faster than their native reaction without an enzyme. So I'm always using this as my kind of expectation in the highest limit that if, like an, any natural or laboratory evolution can hit. But do you think that's the case? <laughs> or it can go beyond but where that? where did those enzymes come from? Nature. Evolution. Yeah. So probably there's a limit. It's just you have yeah. to, the limit is, as you well know, the search uh, op algorithm that you use, where you start and where you search. We know that the answers are out there, right? Unless it's thermodynamically impossible, right? Yeah. But many answers are out there. It's just you have to find it. So you have to solve the problem by doing smarter searches, maybe even some design. Design, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks. And uh, my second question, it seems like uh, we have already been speaking with like a uh, sequence space. So now like uh, something, some, some tools as you mentioned, like for instance, uh, Alpha Photo 2 has been pretty powerful tool in like uh, predicting or establishing like sequence structure relationship. But that's not, that's not enough for a lot of chemists, biochemists, or biologists. We want to know the sequence 
function But there's no PDB of function. That's yeah. the problem. So yeah. we have to accumulate all those data. So what do you think we should do to facilitate that process yeah. in establishing the sequence function relationship? So Bruce. OK, yeah. literature has some, but it's not under any kind of standardized conditions is one problem. No, no, I'm saying that in, so for example, the example that I gave where AlphaFold gave the overall structure of the protein but couldn't tell you that this arginine caused a significant structural change. Um, so to do that, we need to get an equivalent to the PDB, which AlphaFold used in order to predict structures. We're going to need a PDB equivalent for func sequence function uh, data. And I'm sorry, simulations are not sufficient for that, because those didn't answer the question either. <laughs> well, if they did so well, I wouldn't be here, Ari, honestly. I've laughed on that one all the way to the bank. <laughs> no, no, but he's asking the effects of mutation and, and how to write a whole new sequence, right? Yeah. How to design something new. Right, you can explain all you want, but if you can't translate that to a prediction, you don't solve our problem. Francis, can I just jump in quickly? Because you mentioned ML, but then you said that's a whole different talk. Right. But, oh, yeah. uh, Only ML people like ML talks. General <laughs> audiences do not like ML talks. Is there a <laughs> light at the end of the tunnel from AI and sure. ML? Sure, Al absolutely. It's the most powerful process, it's the whole uh, revolution for protein design and structure. Yeah. Any predictions of a time frame maybe where? Next week. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, Come it's moving so week. fast. It's <laughs> moving so fast. I, I can't make, you know, close predictions, but it's going to be in the, it's soon we're going to be making very useful protein. Oh, that's... Uh, Francis. We are making very useful proteins. They just haven't been published yet. And when I say we, companies that are yeah. doing this are, are solving real problems. Yeah. 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 Okay, why don't, why don't we take this question here because yeah. she's been yeah. waiting for a while. <laughs> Thank you, Francis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, guys. I'm Rachel Kimball. I'm a high school student with Dr. DeMonico and Dr. Hutches right now. Um, thank you for doing this. It's amazing. I have a couple different questions. Hope you don't mind, Pranilla. What is that tattoo on your arm? <laughs> okay, which one? I have six <laughs> tattoos. <laughs> but it's all proteins. So it's proteins that I've published enough papers on, I can put them on my arm. So this is Acerin, a blue cup of protein yeah. that comes from your lab. Yeah. Um, here She's is got this. my lab on her arm. <laughs> so I can tell you all of them later, but I have a few, the, the ones that I've studied, but it's all proteins. It's amazing, thank you. What have, what's the like, most significant one for right now? Actually, I think it's this one up here. <laughs> this is an amyloid, so this is what will kill most of us. You know? oh. yeah. That's, yeah? a, that's a fiber, right? It's a fiber, amyloid fiber, yeah. That's, yeah, that's, uh, that's Al she's got Alzheimer's disease on her arm. <laughs> For good or for bad, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, for all of you, what is your most significant moment in your career? Francis, this might be pretty easy for you to answer, but what is the most significant either discovery or just overall moment? I think it was the first experiments we did with directed evolution because we didn't know how quickly the proteins would evolve, nor whether we would get things that were non-obvious. Uh, and, but when I did the first experiments and we all popped all these mutations, you'd, you'd never predict. I said, I, I've made it. I've, I've found something really interesting. Of course, that took all these guys, these Swedes, 30 years to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew back then it was very important. Thank you. Uh, my, my most exciting moment is when we showed that 
electrons can tunnel long distances through proteins like cytochrome oxidase rather than having to come together by big conformational changes. They can, quantum they can tunnel quantum mechanically through distant couplings, and we showed that experimentally, and that was my most exciting moment. Why was it so exciting? Hmm? Why? Mm -hmm. Take that apart. What, what because did you feel in, that in, you had... in, in chemistry, the, uh, the dogma was that uh, metal complexes have to collide and contact in order to exchange electrons, and they wouldn't be able to just tunnel quantum mechanically over very long distances. Uh, Henry Talby's, you know, if you look at his diagrams, uh, there's always, a, on textbooks, there's always metal complexes right in contact in order to exchange electrons. And then there's the, uh, the problem that these big enzymes have metal cofactors that are nanometers away from each other, and how do they exchange electrons? Turns out it's quantum mechanics. It's so quantum, that was it's quantum, really surprising. Quantum, it was yeah. very surprising because I thought that this was not going to be right. I thought they would have to come together, but then we fixed them so they couldn't come together in a structure of known, a known structure, and we forced them apart by two nanometers, and they still exchange electrons <laughs> in milliseconds to microseconds, and that yeah. was. A, yeah, I think a very exciting moment because I wasn't expecting that at all. I was, we we were actually designing these experiments in order to show that they couldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. But when they did do it, surprises, surprises I, I are was, very exciting. I was, I was really yeah. surprised. Yeah. I agree and, to that too. I think it is surprises yeah. where, where you do an experiment and you don't get what you expect, and then you do it again and again and again because then you have to do it many times. And then you start to see, oh, maybe it means something else. Maybe I discovered this. And, and it's, that becomes such a great feeling. I mean, I remember when we, one of the few moments like that, when we saw that proteins change structure in a cell-like environment. You know, the folded state was this different. That, that couldn't be the case. And, and then, but they, that, was, that was the way it was. And, they, and then you had to kind of start to explain that and do other experiments to support that then. For me, it was very similar. It was finding beneficial mutations on the surface of the protein. Yeah. Because back then they told yeah. you the surface didn't matter. You could mm -hmm. change yeah. the surface any way you want. It wouldn't matter at all. And here all these surface mutations were giving rise to whole new properties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've been waiting yeah. a long time. <laughs> Over there. We're just having fun out here. Yeah. Okay, I wanted to thank all three of you for the beautiful talks. I'm a professor here in Berkeley, and I have two questions. One is, Panella, you showed your two daughters. You mentioned a little bit that you're working on some uh, diversity efforts. I would be very curious to hear a little from you, how that you relate that. Um, and the other one is more technical, which involves this ML. I mean, maybe audience don't like it, our students like it, they want to do chemistry and ML. And for example, I was wondering, Panilla, when you came up with a one microsecond or millisecond folding, did you do some experiment on a computer before, or did you just have 20 graduate students trying it out and finally it was the fast one? And how <laughs> would you, more general, how would you see where ML currently fails you? I mean, we got an example of the alpha fold. How could we involve it? Do, do you think in five years all three of you will use this a lot, or at least have your graduate students using it? Will you have more people who sit on the computer than in the lab? Okay, you remember all the questions. <laughs> uh, okay, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Answer. In Same reverse chronological time. order. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Let, let's start with the, the short ones. So the one microsecond folding experiment. So I did that when I was working in your lab. So there was no students. And it was just, we thought it would be a fast protein because it's only had four helices. I actually have it here. Uh, so very symmetrical, nice. small. So that was kind of a... a a designed pick, right? Or, or a qualified pick, maybe. Yeah. Well, uh... it, 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 as I saw it. Um, if you think about the, the gender uh, or diversity inclusion aspect, yes, I have two daughters. And maybe that, that kind of helps thinking more about those issues. But 
I think living in Sweden now, having been in America for a long time, now working in Sweden since 15 years back, I, gender equality and diversity efforts started to come, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So when I moved back to Sweden during that time, I thought Sweden would be fine. Because everybody outside America thinks that Sweden is, you know, ahead in these topics. So when I saw that this was not true, that made me kind of, you know, getting engaged. And I also, the more senior you get, the more you dare to speak up and you can speak up. And I feel like I'm respond I, I want to do this for younger women. <laughs> yes? So I can't get a job at your place. It's, very, it's going to be very hard. And we also have a <laughs> retirement age in Sweden, <laughs> which you passed <laughs> long. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I would be happy to visit you. <laughs> Uh, what's this? What else? No, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> I, I had a grandmother who did a PhD in 1914, so I'm passionate about that subject, in chemistry actually, so I'm so passionate about that subject. But the ML question I ask to all three of you, so, or you might just say we don't want to answer it today, it's unpopular. No, I'm actually taking a course in ML next week because I feel like I need to be a little bit aware and understand enough. I think machine learning and all kinds of AI is coming so much that we all need to be aware and understand so we can you know, use it in the right ways. Well, uh, I've always thought that the great growth of artificial intelligence uh, did nothing to do about uh, natural stupidity. And so uh, that's my feeling. So you are skeptic. <laughs> I think What's Francis already answered it, so I don't okay. want to hold you up more. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions for today? Yeah, here's another question. We have one. One more. Uh, hi, um, I'm Anish. Uh, I'm an undergrad at the Klinman Lab. Um, I had a question for Professor Arnold. So about like the cytochrome C structure you showed where there was like zero angstrom of like binding for like the substrate. I was wondering why you like used it, at, like why you decided to pick that one as your parent enzyme compared to like other heme proteins if like there was no, like, yeah. <laughs> That's a really, really good question. It was our control. <laughs> 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 um, some student asked you how to get into science. Mm -hmm. Maybe I share my, I was grew up in China. No pets, no dogs, no cats. Part of had silkworms. China is famous for silkworms. Now we feed the silkworm with the leaves. The green silk, silk and the leaves, the silkworm spend white stuff. I didn't quite understand. But silk, the leaf, it's uh, cellulose. The silk is a protein. Of course, I didn't understand at that time. Mm -hmm. But that captivated me something I wonder. So as a student, the most important is to learn something is a wonder. It's ask questions, something very common questions. That can keep you in science and also can keep you continuously learning, not just from textbooks, but the daily observations that keep you learning. During lunch, we talk about the fog, which dig there. Fog, fog is uh, particles, water particles, different sizes. The question was, can fog generate some chemical reactions? So this kind of simple daily event, should the students should continuously asking to keep you motivated to do science. Scientists ask us, we are we like a child. We are curious, all the way to, to our old age. That's what uh, science is about, excitement. We, saw, we said we get paid to play. We don't have a job. We don't get a job. We get paid to play. So <laughs> that's really exciting. Now for scientific questions. <clears throat> for Pernina and Harry. Yeah. So people do protein folding, mostly in buffer, in water. 
but the pranayana showed inside the self is highly dense, the yes. substance. Has anybody done protein folding in 10% BSA, a serabumin, or any other proteins? So keep the protein folding with the folding the oh, same yeah, way yeah. with same speed. So most people, and, and when, when this kind of came about, we started to use polymers to kind of mimic the steric effects of being in a crowded environment. Because, for example, FICOL, Dextran, PEG, PEG is not as good as the others, but that would kind of fill up the space. And you would think that those extra molecules wouldn't interact with your proteins. You would only get steric effects. That's not necessarily the whole story in a cell, right? So there's also then that you can try BSA. I mean, the cell is crowded to, to about 300 mg per mil. It's very hard to make whatever protein in that concentration. So you need, if you want to have proteins as crowders, you need to have the proteins that you can purify and have at those high concentrations. And BSA is one good one. But the problem to do experiments in BSA like another protein, is that what signal you're going to look at. So then you have to kind of fiddle or label your protein. People have also gone today and do it, do it, tried to do experiments inside a real cell. You can use in-cell NMR, for example, to try to see your protein. For example, synuclein, mm -hmm. that we both work on then, they have seen that in a cell and they can see it's still intrinsically disordered in a cell-like environment in a cell. So, so people, it's a whole field of kind of crowding. And the yeah. new part is all these enthalpic interactions that are probably there too. Not just Yeah, the well, the cell is very crowded, and so the folding uh, things that get entangled in all kinds of different problems. And so uh, this in vitro work is a long way from what actually happens in a cell. But still, a lot so, of proteins fold in the cell, kind of yeah, like in yeah. the test tube, right? But, it works. Uh, but they undoubtedly uh, encounter barriers that they don't in mm -hmm. these in vitro experiments. And so that's a whole new area that needs to be. And so we need, uh, we need very powerful probes to look in, in vivo folding. We have two more questions, and then we will wrap up for today. So we'll start over here. Hi. Uh, I actually have three possible questions, and they're different for each of you. <laughs> so feel free to like, tell me to stop if I'm getting carried away. But my first question would be for Pranilla. And I'd like to know how you factor in some sort of genetic predisposition for diseases when you're looking at the formation of amylids in cells. Because as far as I'm aware, there is some genetic predisposition people have, and how you would incorporate that, or if you are already in your research. Yes and no. Uh, so for Parkinson's disease, for example, you, you get amyloids of this alpha-synuclein protein, and, and most of the cases out there are sporadic. There's no mutations, but there could, be, of course, be mutations in other genes in your cells that kind of help contribute, but we don't know enough about that. There are, for this protein and for other amyloid proteins, known mutations that will cause early-onset disease. So we have a bunch of those mutations in the protein made in our, in our lab too. So we would always compare wild type to you know, that mutation, that mutation, so, so we would see what happens. Then it's also actually really important in the in vitro experiments that the end terminus of this protein is acetylated in a cell. And most people don't mimic that in the test tube, but that can affect, for example, copper binding. So that's an important additional thing to add on to the protein. So we try to, to think about, you know, in terms of the protein, what mutations you might have. Because many times with a mutation that gives you early onset, you speed up all the reactions that anyway would happen on a, in a sporadic case. So it's easier to follow. Great, thank you. The shortest answer, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if Zichao wants to go, he can go in between my questions. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Matt. So, hi, uh, my name is Zichao, and I'm a PhD student in chemistry at UC Berkeley. And first, I would like to thank you for your wonderful uh, presentations. So my question, uh, so I'm not working in biochemistry, but I still think proteins are very interesting, because different, <laughs> ser uh, different uh, sequences of amino acids could result in different conformation. And this conformation, like you 
have already shown that these conformation can be uh, can be changed uh, by, for example, adding metals or like the protein foldings or redox reactions. So my question is, do you think the dynamic or the pathways in these conformational change are very important for us to, uh, or worth studying? Uh, if it's worth studying, then I know it's very complicated because it might depend on the initial status of the proteins, but also the fluctuations. Uh, so I'm wondering if there are better features or ways to describe these dynamic behaviors. For example, Professor Gray, when you show this protein before folding and after folding, you use like a distribution of the radius to, rep to describe this uh, change, but could there be other better or more effective or more chemically insightful features to describe these dynamic behaviors? Yes. So basically you want to know what my, worth, my work is worth. <laughs> What can you do with what I'm doing? Is that the question? Or how to do it even better? Than how to do it even better? Uh, well, uh, uh. I thought I was doing pretty well. <laughs> um, well, uh, this is a new world of, um, I don't think people appreciate how many intrinsic, intrinsically disordered proteins there are. There are thousands and thousands of intrinsically disordered proteins. And so uh, the standard techniques like X-ray diffraction and uh, cryo-EM are powerless uh, to look at these uh, fluctuating conformations and to freeze them and to try to understand what sites have to be targeted and where they are and how much they're moving and, and, and so on. And so this is an area that uh, is extremely difficult uh, to get around because the standard techniques uh, don't work. And um, I don't think people appreciate how many disordered proteins there are that are uh, doing damage to our systems and how critical they are in, uh, in diseases and how they have to be, uh, you know, targeted somehow, but, but they have to be targeted now by stand, not by standard methods, because we don't, we don't know what the active sites look like. We don't really know what to target. So we need, we're going to need uh, more techniques. We're going to need ultra-fast Raman techniques. Um, uh, Harry, what about NMR? Does this signal the rebirth of high-field NMR in protein well, research? Well, and uh, we're going to need a lot of uh, new NMR techniques as well. So uh, this is just beginning. The techniques that we use and develop are just a small uh, subset of all the techniques we're going to have to develop now to look at these uh, uh, microsecond fluctuations in, uh, in these disordered proteins, which are which all viruses have and, uh, um, and make use of in, in doing damage to us. So um, I think the field, I mean, Dick Zare could help us uh, develop some, I think, some new techniques uh, for these uh, dynamic systems. Uh, but uh, we're going to need a lot of vibrational, new vibrational techniques um, and all sorts of others to get around this. Uh, the ones we're using are just the beginning. Can I ask you a related thing to that, Harry? Sure. Because I was thinking you need new techniques to see what goes on with these proteins, but they will still be hard to target, right? Because they're intrinsically disordered, so even if you know all their dynamics, it's going to be hard to find something that blocks that. Well, uh, the way we're we're doing it is we're looking at what the structures look like when they target. Well, when they target a ribosome, you can then do a cryo-EM structure of that, mm -hmm. uh, of, of that part. And then you know what it looks like when it is doing damage. Mm -hmm. And so you have that information. So you, from that, you know what you have to disrupt. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. uh, we do have information like that if, uh, if we have some direct structural information of when these things actually fold. And they always fold on surfaces. And, um, and so from that, we can, we can get after them. But uh, we, we do need a lot of uh, ultra-fast techniques now uh, to look at these systems. Okay. 
Thank you. So why so don't you... So your question is a very good one. Yeah. Why Thanks don't you ask your last question, and then we'll wrap up for the day. Thank you very much. All right. So I guess then my last question would be for Professor Arnold. And what I was wondering is you described the optimization process as essentially going up one spire of activity. But from, I'm a few years removed from bio, but from what I remember is that evolution does not create the best structure. It creates a good structure that works for what it wants. So how do you know that the spire you're optimizing up for activity isn't present in a much larger field of spires where there is actually much better activity available outside of what you're working on? Well, the easy answer to that is you could drive yourself crazy worrying about that. Um, when, just like biology, what we want is something that works well enough. So we only worry about that question if we don't find what works well enough, and that's related to what Kai was asking. Obviously, the landscape is rugged. Biology is rugged. But it's smooth in at least some of its dimensions so that you can almost always optimize. If you can't optimize enough to solve the problem, then you have to worry about those other spires. I lose no sleep over those. <laughs> Do you have ideas of how you could start to expand the field of search? So that, that is what machine learning is all about, right? So you can, uh, for example, just simply do a, um, a guided search of a bigger part of the sequence space and then machine learning can help you learn from those data and continue up, you know, aspire that it thinks uh, is more promising. So we've published a number of papers on that idea of machine learning guided directed evolution. That's a trivial example, and then there's many more interesting examples. Great, thank you very much. Thank you so much, and I wanna thank everybody here for spending the day with us. And thank you again to all of our speakers and Professor Clark, if you'd like to say um, some closing remarks, please oh, do. Well, I just, I think today went remarkably well uh, because of the speakers and because of the audience. So again, I'd just like to thank the Molecular Frontiers Foundation for all the wonderful work that all of you have done in making this possible. Of course, everybody from Berkeley who played a role as well. And I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Now, we were going to serve copper sulfate smoothies out in the <laughs> lobby, but uh, based on <laughs> Professor Gray's admonition, we won't be doing that. Uh, but we... Russian we, we, we <laughs> Russian blues smoothies, 15 grams a day. Drink a lot of copper sulfate. <laughs> See, not only can science be serious, it can also be fun. Uh, so thank you all for attending, and we look forward to seeing you here tomorrow. Thank you.